In modern housing, facing brickwork is probably the most popular material for the external leaf of cavity walls. In some areas, the traditional walling material is stone. Natural stone and its cheaper alternative, artificial stone, are both quite common, particularly in rural areas. However, a number of houses have a wall finish that is applied after completion of the structure. The most common finish is known as rendering. In the early 19th century, rendered finishes made from lime and sand were fashionable. They needed regular painting with lime wash to keep them weatherproof. The render, traditionally known as stucco, was sometimes incised with fine lines. This was a fairly crude attempt to emulate grander properties built in ashlar stonework. The cost of natural stone was often prohibitive to the speculative builders of the time. During the Victorian period, improvements in cement technology produced renders with better weatherproofing qualities. Render became a common finish, particularly at the rear of properties, where it often hid brick walls of dubious quality. Since the Victorian period, both new and existing buildings have been rendered for a number of reasons. To prevent damp penetration, to provide a decorative finish, and to hide blockwork and poor quality bricks. High heat loss through old walls can be reduced by using special renders which incorporate insulation. The face of the render can be finished in a number of ways. These post-war blocks of flats have panels of smooth render with a painted finish. To eliminate painting, smooth, self-coloured renders can be applied. These contain special sands or a blend of pigments to provide the required colour. Textured finishes can be formed by adding small stones or chippings to the wet render surface. A variety of colours are available. The finish is commonly known as pebble dash. This finish is known as wet dash or rough cast. It's more durable than pebble dash as the stone chippings are not applied afterwards but mixed in with the render and troweled onto the wall. These houses have a Tyrolean finish. It's formed from a pre-mixed blend of cement, sand and pigments, flicked onto the surface of a smooth render by a hand-operated machine. Its texture is similar to rough cast. A dense, strong render mix might contain one part cement and three parts sand. By replacing some of the cement with lime, weaker mixes can be produced. One part cement, one part lime and six parts sand produces a weaker render, but one which is more cohesive, easier to apply and more durable. Liquid plasticizers can be used in place of lime to improve the nature of the mix. This render is one part cement and six parts sand with an added plasticizer. The choice of mixed proportions should be related to the strength and absorption of the walling material, the exposure and the type of finish required. A dense cement rich render tends to shrink as it dries. Soft bricks and some lightweight blocks cannot resist this shrinkage, resulting in small hairline cracks which form a characteristic pattern. Water can penetrate these cracks but cannot evaporate due to the density of the render. Strong renders on weak backgrounds can therefore increase the risk of damp penetration.
weaker mixes containing plasticizer or lime are less likely to shrink. In wet conditions, they will absorb some rainwater, but their relatively porous nature will allow speedy evaporation when the weather eventually changes. Weaker mixes are also more durable, as they can cope with stresses caused by thermal and moisture movement. These hard groove bricks offer good resistance to drying shrinkage and also provide the right degree of absorption or suction to prevent the render drying too quickly. Dense concrete blocks have similar properties. This old wall, however, is very different. The old brickwork is soft, dusty and slightly porous. To overcome these problems, the designer has specified a proprietary adhesive which reduces suction and improves the bond. The render itself is a weak mix to minimize the risk of shrinkage. Where the surface is very poor, separate support for the render can be provided by galvanized or stainless steel lathing. Render should be applied in at least two coats to provide adequate weather protection. Three coats are usually necessary where the wall is uneven, where metal lath is used, or in conditions of severe exposure. The thickness of the first coat should not exceed 15 millimeters. A thicker coat will contain pockets of air and is likely to sag, preventing an even finish. When the undercoat has been applied, a straight edge removes surplus material and roughly levels the render. When the undercoat has begun to stiffen, it should be combed or scratched. This provides stress relief points for the drying render and a good key for the subsequent coat. The undercoat should be left for several days to allow any shrinkage to occur. At the bottom of a wall, the render should not bridge the DPC. To form a neat line, a render stop can be used. This is known as a bell cast bead. External angles can be formed using galvanized or stainless steel angle beads. Temporary vertical battens nailed to the wall is a more traditional approach. The nature of the final coat depends on the undercoat and the required finish. Top coats generally should be thinner and weaker than undercoats to ensure a good bond and minimize shrinkage. The top coat on this smooth finished render is about six millimeters thick. The temporary horizontal batten which has been fixed over the undercoat will be removed when the render has set to provide a decorative detail. When the top coat is firm but not dry, it can be rubbed up with a wooden or plastic float. This roughens the surface slightly and gives an even finish. If a painted finish is specified, Vapor permeable paint should be used to allow evaporation from the wall. Oil-based gloss paints are not compatible with the alkali nature of the cement. In pebble dash, the aggregate is thrown onto the wet top coat. A chemical waterproofer added to the undercoat reduces its suction. This slows the set of the top coat and gives sufficient time to apply the pebble dash finish. Once the aggregate has been applied, 
it should be lightly tamped with a wooden trowel to ensure a good bond. Although render is the most common external finish, there are other options. Tile hanging is often used to add decorative detail to houses. The tiles are supported on horizontal timber battens nailed to the brick or block background. Some householders who want to hide or improve the appearance of the walls resort to more dramatic action. Thin slabs of artificial stone can be bonded to the external walls with special adhesive. It's an expensive form of decoration. Some developers attempt to portray a more traditional image. These non-structural timbers with their infill panels of render are designed to evoke images of traditional timber framing. Plastering in one form or another has been common for centuries. Until the 1950s, most plasters were based on lime and sand, but since then, gypsum plasters have become common. Gypsum is a naturally occurring mineral, which in simple terms, consists of calcium sulphate chemically combined with water. Early gypsum plasters were mixed on site with sand, but most modern plasters are pre-mixed with lightweight aggregates, often volcanic in origin. This Victorian property is in the process of refurbishment. The walls were originally covered with lime plaster, but this has deteriorated over the years and will be replaced with modern materials. Lime plaster is set by a process known as carbonation, where the plaster slowly absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This process could take several months, and meant that long delays were necessary before decorating. Lime plaster was normally applied in three coats. The render coat levelled out the rough surface of the wall. The floating coat provided a true flat surface with uniform suction and the setting coat gave a smooth, level surface for decoration. The thin setting coat would normally contain equal quantities of fine sand and lime. Undercoats contained coarser, cheaper aggregates, often reinforced with animal hair to help reduce shrinkage. Modern gypsum plasters offer a number of advantages over lime. The set is quick and is accompanied by very slight expansion, which prevents cracking. They are easy to apply, and no additional material other than water has to be added on site. A number of undercoat and finish plasters are available to suit the needs of the designer and the differing nature of the backing material. Undercoat plasters usually contain lightweight aggregates and chemical additives designed to match the characteristics of the background. They are usually mixed by hand and applied by trowel, although some undercoats are suitable for machine application. This undercoat is known as thistle hard wall plaster. It's designed for areas of high pedestrian traffic. On even surfaces, such as concrete blockwork, two-coat work is quite acceptable. Because this wall is out of level, a render coat has already been applied to provide an even surface for the floating coat. Once applied, the floating coat which is usually about 11 millimetres thick, is ruled with a straight edge to remove any surplus plaster. Any low spots can then be filled by hand. A 
A straight edge brings the undercoat to a true and level surface. A devil float lightly scratches the surface to ensure a good key for the setting coat. The finish, or setting coat, is a finer plaster which should be applied when the undercoat is firm but not dry. Most setting plasters comprise neat gypsum and can be applied in a very thin layer. These walls are ready for plastering. The huge quantities of water required to mix the plaster can take several weeks to evaporate, delaying decorations and creating temporary problems of condensation. An alternative solution is to dry line the wall with plasterboard. This technique offers a number of advantages over wet plaster. Its dry construction it doesn't require highly skilled labour and there's less risk of material failure due to incorrect mixing or contaminated water. It also offers marginal benefits in thermal insulation because of the gap between board and wall. The boards can be secured by dabs of special adhesive. Other options include fixing the boards to vertical battens or stainless steel channels secured to the wall. Plasterboard is available in a range of sizes and thicknesses. The boards have a gypsum core covered both sides with strong heavy paper. Wallboard, which is used for dry lining, has one ivory coloured face and one grey face. The grey face is designed for a finish of wet plaster. The ivory face, shown here, is designed for direct decoration. The ivory face has slightly tapered edges. The joint is filled with a special compound and covered with tape. The filler and tape can be applied separately by hand or in one sweep using a special machine. Surplus material is spread across the face of the tape and feathered out to give a smooth surface. After jointing, the boards are often covered with a fine sealer to provide uniform suction for the painted finish. These old damp walls contain chlorides and nitrates absorbed from the ground. Eventually these chemicals, known as hygroscopic salts, will migrate to the plaster surface. They absorb moisture from the air, resulting in damp patches on the face of the plaster. Most gypsum plasters can't prevent this surface migration and in damp conditions or where a DPC has been installed, 
cement-based plasters are often specified. Three coat work is normal, with render and floating coats made from a mix of cement and sand with an added salt retarder. The retarder prevents the hygroscopic salts from reaching the plaster face. Like strong renders, these plasters are prone to drying shrinkage. When the floating coat has hardened, the setting coat can be applied. To achieve a smooth true surface for decoration, the setting coat is normally a gypsum finishing plaster. Pre-mixed plasters containing cement, lime and lightweight aggregates can be used in place of cement and sand. Until the Second World War, ceilings were formed from timber lath finished with three coats of lime plaster. Nowadays, ceilings are formed from plasterboard with a plaster or artex finish. There are many types of board, but they're all fixed in a similar way. An even joint with the wall is achieved by fixing perimeter noggings. The board should run across the joists. Staggered joints help prevent cracking of the ceiling finish. Centre noggings, which prevent the board's bowing, are necessary for thin, flexible finishes, such as Artex. When the joints are taped and the nail holes filled, the Artex can be applied. Special tools provide a range of decorative finishes. Partitions divide space and may be load-bearing or non-load-bearing. This load-bearing wall, built on a shallow foundation, supports the upper floor joists and part of the roof structure. Timber studding can also be used for both load-bearing and non-load-bearing walls. Early stud walls were often covered with strips of fur lath nailed to the studs. The lath was finished with three coats of lime plaster. A brick-on-edge infill gave improved sound insulation and improved fire protection. Nowadays, stud partitions are usually covered with plasterboard which can be self-finished or plastered. Horizontal noggings between the studs stiffen the partition and can also provide support for sockets and switches. Mineral wool marginally improves sound insulation. Sound insulation and fire protection can also be increased using thicker plasterboard. In new houses, non-load-bearing partitions are usually made from proprietary systems. This partition is made from a laminate of plasterboard. Although quite thin, it has adequate sound insulation and fire protection and can support modest loads of shelving. The construction is relatively simple. A framework of timber is fixed to the walls, floor and ceiling. A wallboard is then nailed to one side of the frame. Adhesive is supplied to the inside face, followed by the middle layer of plasterboard. Adhesive is applied again, followed by the outer board. The ivory faces are then ready for jointing and taping. The exposed timber, sandwiched between the two outer boards, will eventually be hidden by the door lining. The laminated partition is just one example of a number of proprietary systems. This film has briefly looked at wall finishes, ceilings and partitions. Another film in the series will consider some of the defects caused by incorrect specification and poor site practice.